Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Iran Blog Talk Radio, Radio Show with your host, Minister Amen. And you're listening to it on the Win Network. Yes, that's right, Win Network. Together, we win. They do. Hello and a good evening to you. Welcome to Irene Blog Talk Radio Show. Again, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight, my friends. I know, again, you could be somewhere else doing something else with whoever, <laughs> but I thank you for uh, taking the time to be with me tonight. I am Minister Annie Bell, the host and creator of Irene Blog Talk Radio Show, which is an outreach of Wealth Management Ministries Incorporated. And we are endeavoring to bring talk therapy to survivors of child abuse, sex trafficking, and other traumas, as well as providing awareness, prevention, and resources to the community. Now, as you can hear, we got a fresh new beat. Um, Since we had passed our 50th episode mark, um, we wanted to celebrate a little bit. And so our musical director gave us a hot track. So I want to thank Clifton Dial, who is uh, such a creative, and um, thank you for doing all the work that you do for us and um, being so creative. Now, January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and to commemorate that, we are doing an entire month of episodes on the topic of sex trafficking. Truly, we could probably take, you know, every week and talk about the different facets of um, the sex trafficking industry because it is it has gotten so complex. Um, the sex trafficking industry has turned into a very, very uh, complex amoeba of sorts, and it continues to grow. Its victims come from a very diverse walk of life, and we are finding that traffickers are just as diverse. It's not some seedy character hanging out on a street corner with a black leather jacket, you know, smoking a cigarette, waiting to pounce on an unsuspecting vulnerable child or woman to enslave. I mean, we're finding that there's law enforcement involved. There's mothers, there's fathers and other caregivers who are um, becoming traffickers and their children being trafficked. Um, Judges, pastors, youth leaders. I mean, you just name it. Uh, There seems to be no sector um, that is, you know, hands off. I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. And it's a heinous crime against humanity. Tonight, we have a very special guest. His name is Raymond Bouchard, who has dedicated many years to fighting this industry. He has written legislature. He has written books training curriculum, and, um, and, and is even a movie producer. So I'm excited to have him in our studio with us. Please welcome Mr. Raymond Bouchard to our virtual studio. Thank you so much for coming on board. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is a, a great honor. And uh, as you mentioned, this is uh, tomorrow's National Human Trafficking Awareness Day, so our timing is great. And this is actually the 10th anniversary it began in 2007, and tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. 
And uh, there's some other actually good news. It's a, it's a difficult topic to, to talk about. And I'm so grateful that you have taken on this issue and you have a heart for it and it's been put on your spirit to, to take on this very, very dark issue. It's ugly and you really can't get effective at it unless you're very willing to get your hands dirty. Uh, and I know you're willing to do that. And, and uh, as I go around the country and talk to people about this, as I do some training, as you mentioned, with law enforcement and medical personnel so that they recognize it when they see it, uh, there's very little good news in, in fighting this crime. However, uh, as we get into the story tonight, I'll, I'll share a, a really good piece of uh, good news that happened just yesterday uh, with oh. one of the m- major players of advertising human trafficking in the United States. Um, but I don't know, where do you want to start? You tell me. It's, it's your show, and I'm, I'm, I'm just here to follow your lead. <laughs> Look, I'm just sitting here just like in awe because I'm like, what is he going to say? I think I have an idea because I, I, I think I just posted something on the Irene page, but I'm going to let you tell it. Um, I want to, you know, I want really our listeners because they they they've heard a lot about sex trafficking, obviously, because that our 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 show centers around child abuse, child exploitation, um, right. domestic violence, and sex trafficking. So we talk about it. But one thing that really really drew me to you was you said you want to dispel some of the myths, and um and I like that. I like that because you know even though this topic doesn't need to be sensationalized. It is now because everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, which is good because we, you know, the more um, awareness and uh, the more that people are excited to help stop it, the, you know, the better the prognosis. So um, let's first start with telling our listeners the scope of your work. I know we kind of mentioned here and there what you do, but the scope of your, your, your work and, and how you fight. Uh, on the, uh, you know, against the war on uh, sex trafficking? Well, it, um, it, I'll tell you how it, it, I got into it, uh, it some time ago. I, uh, in my previous career, did communications work for several large ministries around the United States. And I did communi- um, this communications work involved video production and audio production and creating their first websites. And it, gave me the opportunity to travel around the world and get into some really uh, extraordinary circumstances. And I began seeing this thing that I didn't even know to call human trafficking in many different forms around the world as we were shooting video and interviewing people in some of the most destitute and then again in some of the wealthiest parts of the world. Mm. And, you know, in, in human trafficking, in all of its forms, people think it's it's just sex crimes, and that is a huge part of it. However, it's it's not the only thing. Um, the sex trafficking is one segment of human trafficking. The other segments being forced and exploited labor, which is really the largest part of it. Um, most people are not complicit in in sex trafficking crimes, but if we buy coffee, chocolate. Uh, shrimp, cotton products, if we go shopping at some of the big box stores, the products we're buying are touched by uh, tr- human trafficking and, and modern slavery tactics that are used outside the United States mostly to give us very cheap products. That's an enormous part of human trafficking. Um, but we hear quite a bit about, here in the United States, as we should, uh, sex trafficking and sex trafficking of minors, those under 18 years old. And so in doing this work, uh, I came back and I was uh, were making a video in Brooklyn, New York, about this. There was a little documentary about this extraordinary foster care mother who was caring for a little five-year-old girl that the city workers had placed with this woman. Her little, name was Karen, a little girl. She was HIV positive and, you know, she was very sick. And we interviewed the mother, and she, you know, little Karen was very small for her age. She had had the disease since birth. Uh, she got it from her mother. Uh, and unfortunately, Karen did not live to see her seventh birthday. And when I went to her funeral, I met the same city worker we had met some time before when we had, um, when we had uh, created the, the video. And she said, you know, little Karen was one of the lucky ones. And I said, how is that possible? 
Oh, wow. She said, well, she said, you know, because her mother had tried, had gave, gave birth to her and tried to sell her for $200 on the streets of Brooklyn the day after she gave birth to her. And we got wind of it. We took it away from the mother. And she said, this happens all day, every day. Mm-hmm. And Karen just happened to get saved. And I thought to myself, that was just, to me, a defining moment. It was a paradigm shifting moment for me. I was like, how can this not be the biggest story in the world that people are selling their children in America? Yeah. So I began to study the crime, study how it works from infants to adults, and realize that what was being reported in the media, what was being the information being put out by nonprofit uh, agencies, and of course by by entertainment and media and movies, and was just um, superficial. It was um, completely uh, sentimentalized. It was sensationalized, and it doesn't have to be. And so these these myths surrounding it are dangerous because if the first, what I call first responders or first witnesses who might see this crime, the police, medical personnel, even postal carriers, mm-hmm. um, if they don't see what they think this crime looks like, then they just walk away from it. Exactly. And, so that's kind of how I got into it, and I got very frustrated over time about all this um, just sort of – we've heard a lot about fake news recently. All this fake news about human trafficking, how it happens, what happens to the victims, how they get into it, where they come from. And so I wrote this book called The Berlin Turnpike, A True Story of Human Trafficking in America. I live in Connecticut. I'm in Connecticut right now. Um So in 2000, the federal government passed a law called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and it defined human trafficking uh, as to what it is as a crime and what is different from it, uh, what defines human trafficking is different from prostitution. And really that is whether it's force or fraud or coercion used in the act of selling sex. Whenever you've got a pimp involved, you're going to have force or fraud or coercion. That's the legal test under federal Mm -hmm. law. However, if the victim, if the girl or boy who being sold is under the age of 18, that legal test is irrelevant, and it's automatically human trafficking. Mm. Very few people, in, right. even in law enforcement, know that definition. So if you notice something about that, it doesn't require movement. It doesn't require somebody being smuggled into the United States. It doesn't require being uh, uh, crossing state lines from one place to another. So it's just that legal test. So the first trial to take place under that law uh, took place here in Connecticut, in Hartford, very close to where I was raised, uh, along two commercial um, strips of highway, one of which is called the Berlin Turnpike. And even today, 12-mile strip of road in central Connecticut, very wealthy state, has 57 motels on it with over 1,300 hotel rooms through three tiny little towns called Wethersfield, Newington, and Berlin. Mm. So, and that's where this pimp had run most of his girls. And so wow. I studied this trial. It took place in 2007. And that is the basis for the book because that particular trial explained really how the crime of commercial sexual exploitation works in the United States and it dispels these myths that victims are kidnapped. Uh, Victims are not always kidnapped. Yes, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, we hear about it. It Mm -hmm. makes great news stories. It gets a lot of donations to nonprofit organizations when they pump these stories up. It makes people very afraid. But the very fact of the matter is if there's someone gets kidnapped in Atlanta and there's a Amber alert about it, I'm, we're going to hear about it on the national news. So no pimp wants the whole country looking for what he considers his product. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but in this society and this culture we live in, which has been so tainted, you don't have to kidnap girls into this anymore. They are willingly recruited into it. These pimps are brilliant. They know what to look for in the eyes of a young girl who needs to hear Someone say that they're special or that they're loved. So they don't just recruit them. They coerce them. They romance them. And after a time, turn them out uh, 
uh, I was going to say on the streets, that happens sometimes, but mostly this happens online. Uh, yeah. I know you've got a break coming up, so I don't want to go on too long. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if you could, because I want to come right back and revisit a few of the points yeah. that you made. And um, But everybody, please keep your cheeks in the seats. We're going to be right back after just a, a brief uh, station identification and uh, commercial. Okay, one moment. Have you priced commercials lately? Advertising can truly break your budget. At Win, we eliminate the most common hurdle to advertising. Advertise with Win to reach potential customers locally, nationally, and internationally for as low as $150. Yes, that's right, $150 per commercial. We Inspire Network Radio is a new and rapidly growing online radio network that boasts of dynamic seasoned show hosts who are drawing audiences from across the nation and abroad. Africa, Australia, Scotland, Canada, just to name a few. We also have the technical capabilities to advertise your products and services through sound bites, slideshows, and more. No long-term contracts. You pay per show. Advertise on WIN, and you are sure to be a winner. For more information, call us, 201-477-0469. Email Annie Bell at wealthmanagement-fs.org. Welcome back to the I Rain Blog Talk Radio, Radio Show. Show with your host, Minister Annie Bell. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And those who have um, joined us earlier, thank you for staying with us for that brief um, identification moment. I just um, want to just, again, thank you for uh, being part of our growing network, We Inspire Network Radio. And of course, I am your uh, host, Minister Annie Bell. If you're interested in sponsoring a show or advertising on our shows, please contact our marketing department at 201-477-0469. Obviously, nothing in this world is free. So you, um, so anything that you can do to help us to stay on the air, to uh, continue to bring the relevant topics to uh, the forefront, we would appreciate Tonight, we are talking to Mr. Richard Bouchard, who has, again, written books and um, written legislature that was so important for Connecticut. And um, we are, you know, just are just, I'm just humbled to have him on so that he could, we can talk about some of these myths uh, surrounding sex trafficking. So welcome back, uh, Mr. Bouchard. Thank you so much. This is great. You're- I'm so glad you're doing this. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you know, you had said some some things that, you know, really, uh, again, as you say, uh, we ha- have been sensationalized in the news. And not to say it hasn't happened, because we know, we know that people have been kidnapped and, uh, you know, here right in Atlanta, where uh, people are being drugged, actually, from our uh, rural areas. And then, um, you know, wh- whether they're drugged with, uh, pumped with heroin or cocaine, and they're so stoned out of their mind that they don't even know they're right in Atlanta uh, being, you know, yeah. uh, sold uh, for sex. Right. And so, uh, but like you said, this, this, you know, sex trafficking is so horrific that it doesn't need any more, you know, uh, sensationalism than it's, it's already getting. Um, so could you then talk to me, talk to our, our, our listeners as well as to, um, you know, what then, how are the other tactics? Uh, and because I want, really want you to talk about that they don't really need to kidnap anymore or, you know, no. because they can just romance them. This part is very, very important because as parents, there's things that we can do uh, to protect our children and, um and very easy. So could you uh, talk a little bit wow. about that? Yeah. <laughs> There's so many layers to this issue. And as you were talking yes. about Atlanta and, and drugs, you know, the opiate epidemic we have here in the United States 
isn't just uh, killing people in the fact that there's so many young people overdosing because there's cheap opiates, there's cheap heroin, it's very strong heroin. You know, two years ago, uh, the governor of Vermont, Peter Shumlin, gave his state of the state address, as all governors do at the beginning of the year. And for 90 minutes, he only spoke about one topic. Uh, He didn't speak about education, economics, infrastructure. He talked about heroin addiction in Vermont and how it was overrunning the state. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is um, gangs have gone into the rural areas, as you've said, gotten young people, especially girls, addicted um, to heroin, intentionally addicted to heroin. And after someone is addicted to heroin, you and I both know once someone is truly addicted, they will do anything to get yes. that drug. The yes. a part of the mind takes over and that becomes not only just the only pro- well, the first priority, but the only priority. So right. at the very same time that was happening, this opiate epidemic was happening and these gangs were, were pushing cheap, powerful heroin into our young people. Something that no one has been talking about happened. And that is the Canadian Supreme court um, d- uh, disavowed, not disavowed, but uh, dismissed all laws against prostitution in Canada. So prostitution now in Canada is virtually legal everywhere. So what wow. you're finding now is pimps are taking girls from America that have been addicted, going up to Montreal, Toronto, Quebec City, everywhere, and selling them with impunity. And oh my gosh. there is a very large um, – they call it sex tourism. This is men who travel mm-hmm. to different places and skirt the laws of the United States by going somewhere else. Well, typically, that's been Thailand and Costa Rica. Now it's Montreal. So you have yeah. everyone, men from New York and Chicago, all they have to do is cross the, the border in, into Canada, do whatever they want, and come on back. So that's one yeah. huge part of how the drugs have affected this. Mm-hmm. Um, but Again, as you mentioned, how these young people get into it, um, it brings me to the, the, another myth, and one is that um, human trafficking—you know—it it, it's uh, you know it, it takes kidnapping to get someone into it. The other thing is because we've been hearing so much about it in the news and organizations, and people writing books about it, and articles about it, which is great. Um, people think this is a new crime. Mm-hmm. They think it's something that's just because of the internet and because of, uh, of you know, global borders being eradicated to a degree we can cross borders more, more easily now, um, that it's, it's, it's something new. I want to read you a quote about how pimps work. Okay. And very quick, the sinister element is the pimp who attends with the cold-blooded purpose of finding new subjects of debauchery and subsequent exploitation for gain. These agents of commercialized vice are usually well-dressed, well-mannered, and introduce themselves politely and easily to strangers. They often pretend love at first sight and exhibit marked devotion by which girls are deceived and to which they often yield. When the seduction of the girls is accomplished, they are put on the street. Now, that's Mm -hmm. exactly what pimps do, as I described earlier, and that's why they don't have to traffic and they don't have to kidnap. However, that quote, is from a report called Commercialized Prostitution in New York City, published in 1913. What? That quote is over 100 years old. It was a report commissioned by John D. Rockefeller that I dug up out of an old library, and I read through this publication that they, that they wrote in 1912, published in 1913, and it describes how human trafficking works today. Not only isn't it a new crime, oh gosh. but it behaves exactly the exactly same way as it did 100 years ago. I am picking so, my jaw up off my desk. I'm just, I was thinking <laughs> you're going to say 1986 or, you nope. know, 1913. Oh, my gosh. Yep. And it, as you go through this, this book called Commercialized Prostitution in New York City, 1913, it's it's incredible. It's probably the last good report, uh, perhaps the only good report on how this crime works in the United States. But it has it has a, an eternal shelf life. It works exactly the same way now. Um, there's a there's a quote from a massage parlor owner, Margaret, who's 23 years old. And you know um, these illegal massage parlors. We see these little massage parlors that we drive around. These little spas that you mm-hmm. know, strip malls and stuff like that. 
Um, and this quote, I had two girls, but one of them left me the other night because I would not let her take dope. There comes a time with these dope fiends when it interferes with business and they just have to cut it out. That's from one of the massage parlor owners. And that is from 1913 as well. Oh, my Works gosh. Crazy. What I'm doing right now is I'm going onto a website. I'm not going to say the name of it because there's no need to, but mm-hmm. I'm checking in Georgia because what this website does is, it's, you know what Yelp is. Yelp is a, um, a website yeah. where people can review restaurants and hotels and things like that. Well, there is a website where men can go on and review these illegal massage parlors where they're called happy ending massage parlors. And I don't have to explain any further what happens. Mm-hmm. In and mm-hmm. in Georgia alone, because you're in Georgia, correct? In Georgia yes. alone, this website is listing 321 of these illegal massage parlors just in Georgia. Wow. Uh, in, Atlanta, in Atlanta, just in Atlanta proper, there are 45 of them. So, again, not a new crime. They had mm-hmm. massage parlor owners over 100 years ago, and they have them now, and they work exactly the same way. Uh, they bring girls in. They're made to do what they're told to do. They rarely see outside, and they're just brought from place to place. Um, so, as I said, this crime takes on so many different forms and faces. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult to to get a hold of, especially for law enforcement and those who are trying to work against it. Mm-hmm. I, and, I know, you know I'm probably like, giving you more questions than answers, but it, as I no, said, no, no. It, it's it's an extraordinarily complex issue and crime, yeah. and it's very fluid. It changes how it works uh, almost on a daily basis. Yeah. I'm finding, you know, every day as I do research, I'm finding new tricks that these um, pimps use, exactly. new ways they use the internet and and use cell phones. And exactly. I'm, part of my job is tr- to train law enforcement. Here in Connecticut, we have a law where all law enforcement officers have to get trained um, to recognize human trafficking. And mm-hmm. I do that training. And if I do it one week, by the time I do it the next week to a different group of uh, cops, I've got to change it. I've got to change a good part of it because already what they're supposed to be looking for has changed. It's exactly. it's extraordinarily exactly. difficult. And there, yeah. you know, I I try not to get discouraged because as I wrap my head around one of their tactics or strategies, then another one comes up. You know, then I'm yeah. reading about it yet another way that they're victimizing, and um, it, because they're like five to ten steps ahead of us, you know. Which yes. is ridiculous when you consider that yes, the crime has been around, like you said, over a, you know a century, a decade, um, and so you are you would think that our um, you know our systems would be better, but did it catch us off guard? Is that what it is? We didn't realize that it would seep into our rural families and suburban homes. Is that? We, did we just yes. think that this was for the drug addicted and um, yeah. you know runaway youth? Is that is that where we went wrong as a nation, as a community? Yeah. So it, you mentioned runaway uh, youth as a specific population. Multi, uh, a young person who is multiple runaway has run away multiple times has an extraordinarily high victimization rate of being yeah. caught in commercial sexual exploitation, as, as you probably already well know. But mm-hmm. the rise in human trafficking, this explosion of it, um, is, is due to a number of reasons. And I'd really love to go into those. Probably takes a little bit more time than we've got before the break. But, of course, it, it, it's a lot of different reasons. But then, of course, it's the Internet and our smartphones. Because now, mm-hmm. for the first time in history, no man has to drive around in that part of the city or that part of town at night right. to that corner in doesn't 24 seven now. It doesn't matter the weather, time of day, time of mm. year. He can go onto his smartphone, just his smartphone and have a girl delivered to him like a pizza. Yeah. He doesn't have to go anywhere and he can no. go right to where he wants to go. And it's, uh, it's again, yeah. it's mind boggling, but it's again, it's, um, I believe that this is something that we could uh, get ahead of and really size it down, uh, but it t- it's going to take some concerted effort. Uh, when we come back, yes, take take the time to uh, say what you wanted to say, but everybody, if you could just, again, 
Stay tuned. We'll be right back with Mr. Raymond Bouchard in just about two minutes. Hello, my name is Minister Lloyd Bell Jr., CEO of We Aspire Network Radio. God bless you, and I am Minister Annie Bell, the COO of We Inspire Network Radio. We had you, our listeners, in mind when we created We Inspire Network Radio, or as we like to call it, Win Radio. We incorporated your thoughts and opinions to ensure that our programming will embody true inspiration. And we will continue to bring relevant and heartfelt shows that cater to the needs and wants of our growing listener base. Please, subscribe to our network so that you can stay connected. Join us here every week where together, through God, we win. Welcome back to I Rain Blog God Radio Show with your host, Minister Annie Bell. Yes, like he said, welcome back to Irene Blog Talk Radio Show. We are powered by We Inspire Network Radio. I am your host, Minister Annie Bell, and we are one of the many outreaches of Wealth Management Ministries Incorporated, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we endeavor to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor through the teaching of financial literacy and Christian counseling. So we are back. Uh, this evening with Mr. Raymond Richard, and we were just, again, talking about the complexities of uh, human trafficking, uh, more so sex trafficking, and, um, you know, how did it get started? But like he said, it's it's been around. I mean, prostitution is the, and I've heard this, uh, and I guess it's being proven, is the oldest profession in the world. And, um, yeah. And it, yeah. Uh, yeah, we hear ahead. that we a lot. Say well, it's it's we hear that a lot, um, uh-huh. and it's I always make the distinction. And people, when I do my training sessions, people will say things like that, and they'll bring up or ask my opinion on prostitution. And mm-hmm. I say, listen, we're not talking about prostitution. We're talking about human trafficking, which is which is slavery. Right. So I have to make always make that distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, um, prostitution, right. while it yeah. As I was about While illegal that, prostitution sort of it, it is prostitution is still voluntary, if you will. It's one person agreeing with another person to do something sexual for money. There's no mm-hmm. third person involved saying you're going to do this or forcing them or coercing them or drugging them or whatever. Right. So it's really a different crime and laws around the country now are beginning to finally pick up on the fact that the, there's a distinction between these two things. And the laws are becoming much more serious for the human trafficking um, uh, world, if you will, and that that, that crime. It's been around forever. There's um, there's an in, uh, there's another quote I want to read you. Um, let me see if I can get back to it here. Oh my goodness gracious! Of course I can't find it now. Um, mm-hmm. Well, while you're looking at that, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to um, make a quick statement that there. And again, because it is uh, prostitution and sex trafficking is so um, easily by the by the layman is so easily confused. But there is a distinct difference. And like you said, the difference is the coercion, the um, the force that it takes to make someone do the thing that they don't want to do, which is sell their body. Whereas, like you said, prostitution is um, is different now. Pimp yeah. and human trafficker, they are about the same. Would you Would you agree? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Pimps Pimps are human traffickers, and this is one of the things that really, really gets to me is that our modern lexicon, our modern culture, uh, has taken the word pimp itself and made it an adjective that means fancy or bling or pimp my ride or wow that yeah. car's really pimped out. Mm-hmm. And a pimp nothing more than a slave master. That's what a pimp is. He's a modern day slave master. And so you're taking this really horrible thing and, and, and giving it a a sterilized, cleaned up 
uh, fancified version of itself, and it diminishes what a horrific crime uh, this person is committing and these people sure. commit. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But, and um, I wish while you yeah. are writing legislature and, you know, I hope to uh, jump on the bandwagon with you is that we can um, make the Johns just as responsible for the crime. Um, because right. here in America and we, and, and abroad, we will um, charge the, the traffic, the victim, and some of them are minors, and they are then sent away with uh, charges on their record while the Johns get a slap on their wrist and, yep. uh, and, and permission, if you'll call it, to go and do it again. If the demand side goes down, if we would just focus yep. on the demand side, then there will be no need for supply. Um, would you agree or would you would, – Oh, would, my gosh, yes. It? I totally agree. <laughs> Two things, and people always say, how do we stop this? And the first thing I say is something I heard. I, I went to a training session with, with um, at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children a couple of years ago, and I was the only civilian in the room. The rest of the people in the room, about 60 of us, were all long-term detectives who focused mm. on sex crimes against children. And mm -hmm. the whole week-long training was about um, sexual exploitation of children, commercial sexual exploitation of children. And at the end of the week, they said, my God, how do we stop this? I mean, these – these cops were tough. They were uh, decades of experience each. And one mm -hmm. of them just said, you got to love your kids. And they all nodded oh. and went, yeah, that's pretty much it. Because wow. the way mm -hmm. these kids get recruited into it is if nobody has genuinely loved them, because we yes. all crave that, and somebody mm -hmm. comes along and they fill that void and they've got them. So that's one thing. Wow. But the demand side is men having the guts to say and to communicate to other men, this is not something that's cool. You don't do this. Um, wow. You remember just a few years ago when we all had cell phones in our cars and we all had cell phones in our hands, <laughs> we thought nothing of driving and talking on the phone and, or then driving and texting. That's well, right. within a couple of years, people started to say, yeah, you can't do that anymore. You're killing people. And everybody mm -hmm. now is just somebody texting or talking on the phone, you get mad, you slap it out of their hand if you're the passenger, you beep at them if you're the, the person behind them and they're not going at the green light. It's going to, so that was a cultural shift. Now, granted, yeah. this is going against human nature to say, you know, a, a man buying sex. However, it's going to take, this problem starts with men and mm -hmm. it is going to have to be up Ooh, to men to end it. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. No other way to say it. Men are going to have to tell other men, cut this, you know what, out. Yes. This is not something. Man, you and can that's say really... that three more times, I tell you. Um, yeah. Because you, you're right. That's where, like I said, where the demand is coming from. And, and because there are so many, uh, especially in the more impoverished countries, and even in our own country, in our areas um, that that's you know, experiencing poverty, that is... Um, it's so easy to be able to go and make money by selling your child, selling your, you know, just, and I said this in my, in my um, group just the other day, just for an orgasm, we are willing to, um, you know, uh, sell our kids, kill our children. I just put up uh, a story about a young, uh, about a lady who killed her 14 year old daughter because she fantasized about having, um, seeing her being raped and uh, fantasized about the murder itself. So she was killed for orgasm, um, you know, to fulfill oh a sexual fantasy. And when we break it down to the bare bones, we're talking about these men who just basically are seeking a sexual release. They're looking for an orgasm. And, um, and that's, that's is sickening to me. And, um, I know. and the, the amount of trauma that the victim uh, undergoes for the rest of their lives, just yeah. for a 30 second, a minute thrill is beyond anything that I can understand. And so, um, like you said, if we will, you know, take a hard look and do that cultural shift and let it 
happen with men talking to other men to say, this is not right. This could be your sister, your daughter, you know, your niece or whatever, your mother, and, um, and, and turn that around. I think that would be a great movement. So I applaud you for that. Oh, my gosh. Great information. Yeah, it, it, it's – but, I mean, good, that talk about a cultural shift. Like, as you said, it's one of the world's oldest professions, world's oldest activities, and you're trying to tell men to say, okay, stop this. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't even 100 years ago that if a man was caught beating his wife, the cops did nothing. That wasn't even 50 years ago that the cops yeah. did nothing. So that's, that's something that's changed. So this can change too. You know, mm-hmm. That had to be, yes, that had to be laws, but that also had to be men saying to other men, this is, you know, you don't do this. This, you know, yeah. you're, this is a cowardly way to live your life. And the power and control and everything else that a man feels when he has control over, especially a, a, a female, a younger person, what have you, you know, that's, that's something we're up against. But this rise of human trafficking now it's exploding. It's not an old, it's, it's, it's an old crime, but the way it's way it gets to people now, as I mentioned, you don't have to be on that, the, the street anymore. Um, there are a number of dynamics that I talk about in my training as to why it's uh, exploding the way it is. And I'll start into a little bit of that now. Maybe we can finish it off after the break. Um, the first is that, you know, the war on drugs is what, 50 years old now. Mm-hmm. Every local, county, state, federal criminal justice professional knows how to recognize, investigate, prosecute, and put away drug crimes and, and criminals. They know exactly what to do. Mm-hmm. With human trafficking, very few know what to do. They don't know what to evidence to gather. They don't mm. know how to bring it to a prosecutor. The prosecutors don't know what to do. Oh, wow. it's, it's just extraordinary. Um, That's one thing. So there's no criminal justice machine, as there is for drugs, for investigation, prostitution, uh, prosecution of human trafficking. The other thing is there's no suspicion. If I'm driving around, I'm a drug dealer, and I've got a couple of bags of heroin or what, or some meth in my trunk, and I get caught, I'm just going to jail. That's just all there is. I've got that much. It's intent to it's intent to sell. I'm going to jail. If I'm driving around, I'm a pimp, and I've got two girls with me. I'm just a guy with driving around two girls. Right. It's not illegal for me to be with my product. So the suspicion is gone. This is one of the other reasons bad guys mm. are starting to move into human trafficking instead of drug trafficking. Right. Another yeah. reason is there's no product to buy. When yeah. I sell that trunk full of meth or heroin, I've got to take fun. some of that cash and restock my inventory. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do that with a girl. I'm, you know, people say they're selling these girls. Nah, they're renting them. At 100% mm-hmm. profit every time, they get their product back and make That's 100%. Right. Per- you don't do that with drugs. So you mm-hmm. get a much bigger return on investment with a girl than you do on drugs. That's right. That's right. Another thing and, is – go ahead. I was going to say, like you said, that's one of the reasons why um, so many uh, are, are, like you said, going moving away from the uh, gun trafficking and drug trafficking because it is much more lucrative. Um, to to sell a a body because you can, you get that body back after that person is done with their fantasy um, you get that yep. body part back and so you can resell that body over and over and over again and just to let you know I'm going to go ahead and make an executive decision and skip our ne- our next uh, commercial because um, I want to okay. make sure that we're getting uh, <laughs> maximizing our time with you so go ahead. So there's that. There's no product to buy. You don't have to buy your product every time or restock your inventory, as you said. The other thing is this, and this is really interesting, and I, I, I get a little pushback from law enforcement on this, and it's kind of interesting the reactions I get it, but, there's, there, but they, I kind of bring them around to it. So when there is a drug bus, if you're a detective, Atlanta Police Department or wherever you might be, and you make a big drug bust, there's a thing called asset forfeiture. So Mm -hmm. the police department gets all the goodies that were taken from that drug dealer, his cars, his bling, his cash, his jewelry, everything, and they can sell it. And there's websites where you can go online and buy the stuff that's sold at what's called police auctions, Mm -hmm. all these things that they get from good good drug busts. 
So if you're a detective, you make a good drug bust, maybe not only do you get that drug bust on your record, but you've just brought in perhaps a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars to your department that is totally black ink and a total, you know, it's a total win for the department. Mm-hmm. In a human trafficking crime, not only do you not know how to investigate and prosecute it, but the victim gets the asset forfeiture, not oh. the police department. So if you've got this big stack of crimes on your desk, big folders of everything you've got to investigate, and they're all drug crimes, and you've got this one that's human trafficking that you don't know how to investigate, and you're, there's no win for you, there's no win for your department, and you've got this drug crime over here, all 30 of them, and you know that in there there's a good deal of money for your department, which one are you going to pick? So there's a reduced law enforcement motive to investigate these crimes. Mm, gosh. Yeah. Gosh. I'm now, beyond that. Have, um, the, uh, the SVU here from Atlanta, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the next two weeks. And that's, that's great. You know, yeah, because that's something that I'm going to actually, you know, talk about and ask. <laughs> but that's, yeah. you know, I never thought about that. So, Wow. Yeah, it's it's not something that's talked about. Um, I'm not real popular for bringing that up a lot, but well, what uh-huh. are you going to do? I, I, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, it, it, and you do the same thing. You speak truth to power, that's and right. when you do that, power pushes back. But Amen. what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. another thing is that prostitution itself, or selling sex and pimpdom, uh, I'm using, I'm making up that word pimpdom, the culture of mm-hmm. pimpdom is really becoming mainstream. You can go on Amazon.com right now and buy about a dozen different books on how to be a pimp. You can buy videos on how to be a pimp. The taboo against selling your body for sex has diminished greatly over the past generation of young people. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, I mean, Kids in junior high school now are doing things sexually that I didn't know existed until after I graduated yes. college. Yes. I gave a talk at a university recently, and a freshman girl came up to me and said, you know, I grew up on Long Island, and I worked at Burger King, and all of my friends made fun of me for making minimum wage because they were in the back of the theater at night making $10, $20 to put their hands on boys, sometimes their mouths on boys, you know, in five minutes, and they'd come out of the movie with fifty, sixty dollars, and right. there I am working for hours, and they and all of my friends were doing. So it's 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 not seen as something that's bad anymore. It's almost seen as a lifestyle choice for mm-hmm. even a young person. Now, how easy is it then to recruit a girl who's doing that already on her own, but exactly. pimp finds her, and says, hey. What are you doing making 50, 60 bucks? You could be making $2,000 a day with me. We could be going to mm-hmm. parties every night, going to clubs every night. I could have you drive right. on. You can get right in past, you know, they'll open the red velvet rope for you, get right in. They are, uh, so it's become mainstream and acceptable for young people. So that, that, yeah. that, 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 that taboo is, is almost completely gone. Now is, that brings me in, um, go ahead. In this society, you know, there is chastity, and uh, maintaining your virginity is is not a big deal anymore. Um, not it's at more all. of a big nope. deal if you are the girl that give it up, and um, you know uh, you become more uh, what, what's the word popular in school, and you know it's and like you said, reversed. yeah, yep. like you said, there's things that these the kids are night. doing that we would never have thought to do when Ooh. we were growing up. And um, there was just a, a small amount of us that were out there, you know, having sex or whatever, and they were looked upon as cheap. And, you know, people talked about them be- behind their back. But um, nowadays, you're the one being made fun of if you're trying to maintain we're your not virginity. doing it. It's yeah. Completely yeah. reversed. It completely is. reversed. It is. Back in the day, it was like, that was the girl who's a slut. That's the girl who's cheap. She'll do it with exactly. anybody. Mm-hmm. Now, the people who get made fun of are the girls who don't do it. That's right. Who don't just That's give right. it completely. It's completely reversed, which brings me to my, the next point in the rise of human trafficking. It's such easy product acquisition. These wow. guys, these camps do not need to go to a different country. There's, there's absolutely no reason to go to Albania when you can just get your product in Atlanta. 
it, it, and these, the girls are everywhere. And these, these, as the quote from 1913 said, these guys are brilliant, the pimps. They are mm-hmm. char- charismatic. They know exactly what to say to a young girl or even an older adult who is easy and ripe for recruiting. And wow. because of this, this mainstreaming of the whole industry, we'll call it, it's very easy for them to find their product. Now, I wrote the book about a man called Dennis Paris who was put on trial here in Connecticut, as I said. Uh, he's now doing 30 years in an Arizona federal penitentiary. Now, the four girls that testified him against, against him at his trial, one was from Vermont, one was from New Hampshire, and one was from a small – two of them were from the same high school here in Connecticut. He didn't recruit any of them. One of his girls recruited her niece. Her niece recruited one of her friends, and then she recruited two girls from a high school who, rec- who just came in together and willingly. So it's extraordinarily easy to get a pimp's product, which is a human body. Uh, human body. Oh, my um, gosh. I know. It's, 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 people think that the pimps are out there doing all this recruiting. A lot of times it's the other girls in his stable doing the recruiting. Mm-hmm. Um, but, so another reason for this explosion, I said, is this, this, the myths and mis- and misinformation um, because people don't know what to look for. And we've gone over a few of them already, the fact that people think it's a new crime. They think that victims are always kidnapped. They think also, and here's a big one, especially with law enforcement people from hospitals who might come across these victims, they think they're from other countries. When we hear about human trafficking victims, we think it's from some scared uh, person who doesn't mm-hmm. speak English, who doesn't have a passport, maybe who, you know, his skin color is a little darker than our own or whomever. So they're, you know, that we're, we're looking for foreigners if we're law enforcement or for hospital personnel. The truth is, the fact is, the vast majority of these victims in America are American. As mm. I said, these four, yeah. four girls that testified against the guy in my book, two uh-huh. from, one from Vermont, two from Connecticut, one from New Hampshire. That is the truth across the country. Most of these victims are American uh, girls and boys, men and women. You don't need mm-hmm. to bring them in from other countries. It's mm-hmm. just too much money and too much time. Why would you do that when they're right here? Right. And, of course, as I said earlier, another one is the substance abuse epidemic. Once you have someone hooked on drugs, you can get them to do anything you want. It's so much more effective than the chains and shackles of slavery in the colonial era. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. When you have, they will come back to you. Not only are these girls, especially addicted to the drug that the pimps give them, but they literally and intentionally ad- get the girls addicted. And I know this is kind of a, sounds strange, but it gets them addicted to the personality of the pimp. Mm-hmm. These girls think that they cannot live or survive without mm-hmm. have that pimp in their life. Yeah. And they will go back to them time and time again, even years later. One victim I've worked with now for eight years, and she still talks to her pimp. She still talks about him adoringly. She has never said anything bad about him. It's extraordinary. Um, so you've got the, the, the substance and personality um, addiction, which allows the pimp to control their victim. Uh, mm-hmm. But of course, the biggest factor, as I've said earlier, is the Internet and how that has allowed this crime to act co- with complete anonymity uh, for both the John and the pimp. You can go online uh, to multiple websites, even Facebook, and find escort services, find a girl to buy. And the win I talked about yesterday, if you mm-hmm. remember a few from a few years ago, remember – there was the big Craigslist controversy because Craigslist had their adult section and their escort section. And that yes. was the biggest problem for prostitution and human trafficking in the world. And they removed it in 2010. And at the time I was writing a book and I said, you know, this is too powerful. It, it, ha- it has had to um, migrate it to other websites. And it did mm-hmm. it migrated to Facebook it migrated to other websites like Adult Friend Finder and Fling.com and uh, Ashley Madison, which we've heard all about in the news because they got hacked. Some of these are 
pretend to be mainstream dating websites, but they're really just paid uh, paid for sex websites. Now, wow. one of the other page places that it migrated to was Backpage.com, yeah, which looks just mm-hmm. like Craigslist. It's uh, yeah. it's basically classified ads online, and for years people went to Backpage.com to to their escort section because. Every day, hundreds of times a day, there'd be girls listed in every local community in America. Mm-hmm. Well, the win I was talking about, as of yesterday, Backpage has removed their escort listings from their website. Amen. Uh, and that is that is right. That is the um, you know the what I was what I saw and put up yeah. on our page as well, which deserves this some applause. <laughs> for that. And, and, you know, I was reading that they made $135 million off of just ads. Easily. Yep. And, Absolutely. And in my, in my, and what I want to say is I believe that the executive should spend time in prison as a trafficker. Um, those who continue to allow the back page to, um, uh, to stay in business, and I also think that that one hundred and thirty five million dollars should be given to the victims um, identified victims of the back page trafficking and um, for their you know uh, transition back into society, some help with their uh, counseling and therapy because again, we know yeah. that this is traumatic you know um, so yeah Absolutely. We, you know, thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> The CEO of Backpage was arrested in October and charged with yes. pimping. Mm-hmm. Um, Carl Ferrer is arrested. But he in got away, didn't he? Um, he, didn't, he didn't really receive a charge. Well, it's still pending, but I think I think part of his deal was to shut this thing down, which he which uh-huh. they did yesterday. So, wow. Uh, charged with pimping a minor, pimping a conspiracy to commit pimping. To, you know, so. It's it's really um, and the two uh, some of the big shareholders of Backpage, uh, Michael Lacey and James Larkin, they are also charged with conspiracy to commit pimping. These are uh, so it's it's you know probably part of the deals to take the. I mean the jig was up for these guys. There were so yeah. many people after them and they, they just couldn't get. It was so obvious what was going on mm-hmm. uh, that it didn't happen anymore. So again, as I said earlier, I'm doing a a training for police chiefs here in Connecticut next week. And I've got to change my presentation once again, because yes, back page is gone, and uh, that's no longer a thing uh, they they're going to look to, uh, but it's going to migrate somewhere else. Right. And see, that was the argument for keeping the ads on back pages. The police could go there and find mm. out where the activity was happening. Uh-huh. My argument was that's like saying, well, don't don't arrest the drug dealer at the the playground next to the elementary school because. You know, at least we know where to find them. Right. You know, it's just a crazy logic. I mean, if, if the police it's are good really, at investigating, they can find these people. They don't need a website to to point them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Wow. Listen, we only have a couple minutes left. I want to make sure that our listeners can get in touch with you. I know I'm hoping that you and I will do more work together as well mm. going forward. So but I want to make sure that my listeners can get in touch with you. Go um, If there's any training that you have, anything that you would like to um, tell our listeners about, you know, please take this next 90 seconds to do so. Certainly. I have the easiest email in the world to remember. It's just Raymond at Raymond email. So dot email is a new URL like dot com or dot org. So it's just Raymond mm-hmm. at Raymond dot email is my email address. And I do, as you said, I, I my books are on Amazon dot com, both unspeakable about child trafficking around the world and the Berlin Turnpike about here in the United States. Uh, I do trainings for high school students, law enforcement, medical personnel, postal carriers, really anything as far as people who need to be warned about this from parents, both in a community uh, setting or a church setting, and first responders like law enforcement, medical personnel. I do quite a bit of training, and um, I'm available to do that all the time. All you need to do is just send me a message at Raymond at Raymond.email. Great. Again, and, and we'll I'm make just, it happen. Okay. I'm just honored and have, I mean, this was a, a eye opening even for me and I've been, you know, doing this for several years. And so thank you for um, taking the time and being 
um, is, is so detailed in what you're uh, bringing out. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our communities. And um, I just uh, pray all the best for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having the courage to take this on. And thank you for having me on the show as well. And I can't wait to work more with you in the future. Amen. Amen. Now, um, I just want to take a brief moment before I know my show is over, but take a brief moment. We want to also make sure that we talk about what's going on with the uh, pedophilia. Uh, They are have somehow lodged themselves with the LGBTQ community and trying to push for the pedophilia being an orientation and not a disorder from the DSM-5. And so, Please, if there's anything out there, go talk to your congressman, go talk to um, uh, any of the, you know, people in the psychological community to say to make sure that this does not happen. Uh, They're trying to normalize pedophilia. They're trying to bring it into the mainstream like, you know, like uh, the LGBT community did. And they're using the same tactics. But we know that adult child sex is not good for the child. It is not something that the child, they're not really ready uh, uh, in, uh, physically, physiologically speaking, mentally speaking, to have this, um, any sex going on before they are of age. So please keep that in mind. Secondly, just want to give you a, our, um, our wisdom to reign. Don't, um, don't hide your scars, number one, but you are on the precipice of your life. You can go backwards, you can stand still, you can fall, or you can take a leap. So I would say take a leap of faith. To make a donation or get in touch with me or my team, please go to www.wealthmngt.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Irene Stop Abuse and Abolish Sex Trafficking. Also, you can go to our YouTube channel, Irene Blog Talk Radio, and become a subscriber so that you won't miss great shows like you just heard here. So repeat after me. I reclaim my life. I excel at living. I illuminate the dark. I grow in Christ and I nurture myself and others. I reign. Let's reign together with Christ. And I pray that you will um, join me next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Good night, everybody.